Whoever hath her wish, thou hast thy will, and will to boot, and will in overplus, more than enough am I that vex thee still, to thy sweet will making addition thus. Wilt thou, whose will is large and spacious, not once vouchsafe to hide my will in thine? <laughs> The International Monetary Fund. One third of block of debt. If there was one city where World War III could have broken out in the past 20 years, it was Berlin. Please read the declaration aloud. I hereby undertake not to remove from the library or to mark, deface, or injure in any way any volume, document, or other object belonging to it or in its custody, not to bring into the library or kindle therein any fire or flame, and not to smoke in the library, and I promise to obey all rules of the library. This way, Lang. One mustn't burn the books. Surely that doesn't include the works of Professor Burnett here. Yeah. Good morning, Basil. Good morning, Doctor. Rice. I think if some diligent reader were to build a pyre from selected academic tomes, they'd undoubtedly be acting in the Bodleian's best interests. Yes, uh, thank you. But where would it end? Hugh Trevor Roper, A. J. P. Taylor. It would be a fire that would set Oxford burning for a thousand years. <sighs> Professor Burnett. Yes. Do you think it might be possible to engineer a meeting with Dr. Rouse? Oh, I'm sure it can be arranged. I've been hoping to meet him properly. Uh, you're young, not altogether unattractive. I'm sure he'll oblige. I'm sorry? I don't know if I should feel a pang of professional jealousy. Am I being spurned for Dr. Rouse? No, not at all. I, I just wondered if he might read some poems of mine, offer a critical opinion. A handsome young man inviting criticism? For Dr. Rouse, that would be a temptation hard to resist. Uh, just don't ask him about his poetry. Or he might read you some. Come in. Good afternoon, Dr. Rouse. Yes? Uh, my name's Lang, Alex Lang. I believe Professor Burnett spoke to you. Yes, yes, of course. Come in, sweetie. Tea? Thank you. Lang, of course. I recognized your arms from your viva. You excelled in the fellowship exam. Well, I wouldn't say excelled. That's the first thing one must learn about a life led in academia. Take any praise that's given to you and pretend you deserve it. Uh, do sit down. What a superb view. <laughs> the Radcliffe camera. It's nothing compared with the view from the bedroom. I'm sorry? The window overlooks the warden of New College's garden. You wrote an excellent thesis. Oh, thank you. Court musicians in the age of the Virgin Queen. Yes, I'm, I'm hoping to expand on it. A book, perhaps. Professor Burnett tells me you have quite an appetite for my books. Uh, oh, yes, Dr. Rouse. Ever since I read your book on Shakespeare's sonnets, identifying the Earl of Southampton as Shakespeare's lovely boy. Yeah. A very convincing theory. Not a theory, Lang, a fact. I'm assuming you've read Queen Elizabeth and her subjects. Naturally. And? Excellent. Excellent? I, I, I don't know what else to say. Excellent is quite sufficient. Professor Burnett is your supervisor. Uh, yes, Dr. Rouse. I'm helping him to index his new book, Macbeth in the Age of Shakespeare. Really? He said he thought it would be good for me. Good for you to list names in alphabetical order. You're a fellow of all souls, not a prep school scholar. What's he paying you? Satisfaction is its own reward. Who told you that? Professor Burnett. He says that you're a budding poet. I've written some poems. Not to your standard, of course. They wouldn't be. I wondered... Yes? I wondered if you might be good enough to take a look at them for me. By all means. And in return... Yes? I'd be grateful if you'd let me quote from your paper in my new book. Oh. Of course. Simon Foreman, Sex and Society in Shakespeare's Age. I think you'll find it more academically rigorous than Burnett's parochial penny dreadful. He's been very good to me, Professor Burnett. Has he indeed? Helping me find my feet. 
I think you want somebody with slightly more sophistication to lead you by the hand. My thoughts are winged with hopes, my hopes with love. Mount love unto the moon. Professor Burnett. Ah, oh, Lang. Current cut down, so expect a refund. I'm sorry? Nine across, nine letters. Beginning with O something E. If I've got tooled and kneecap right. Oh. Yeah. Well, I'll give it some thought. Good. Good. I visited Dr. Rouse yesterday. And you escaped unscathed? We talked and I walked away entirely unmolested. I'm not sure that I should take that as a compliment. Of course, when he leaves, all souls will be the poorer. Saner, but nonetheless poorer. I suppose he bent your ear about his lovely boy. You mean Shakespeare's lovely boy? Do I? If it isn't lovely boys, and it often is, then it's the dark lady. On and on. He's certain he'll finally unmask her before his fellowship expires. And when is that? The year after next. Although I can't see him going quietly. He was talking about his foreman book. Groundbreaking stuff. Is that your opinion? Or Rassi's? He must have written four books in the past year. I can't see how the man juggles so many ideas at one time. I should find myself completely... Overtaxed. Quite. A apparent cut down, so expect a refund. Nine mm. across. Ah. Yes, yes, that would fit. Apparent cut down. Clever. Yeah. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's Rice's sense of moral outrage. He's been reading my paper. Has he indeed? He said it showed distinct promise. Oh, dear. He doesn't damn with faint praise. He crucifies me. He his... asked if he might quote me in his foreman book. Tread carefully, Lang. Carefully? Why? I'm not entirely sure in Rouse's case that the debt is ever truly acknowledged. Whatever it is he wants to quote, he'll have you thinking he came up with the idea in the first place. Ah. Oh. <laughs> have you ever seen him driving a motor car? Ah. Uh... An Elizabethan pitted against modernity. And the Elizabethan winning hands down. He said he rather fancied himself in the court of Elizabeth. Oh, they had one viperous old queen to contend with. I'm not sure they could have coped with two. Uh, Dr. Ross. Oh, too busy to talk, Lang. Up to my eyes and Simon Foreman. Uh, I wondered if you might read this for me. Another paper? Quite prolific, aren't you? Uh, only if you have the time. For you, sweetie, I shall make the time. Are you free this afternoon? I thought I'd take a walk to Worcester College. You'll come with me? Uh, thank you, Dr. Rouse. Then I shall see you here at half past two. <laughs> As Houseman said, I still go up my staircase two steps at a time, but only in the hope that I'll be dead when I reach the top. But then, I'm not as stricken in years as Houseman was. No, Dr. Rouse. That is the correct answer. Worcester College has the most beautiful gardens in Oxford. But even Worcester can't hold a candle to Trenaran. But then I suppose I'm biased. I'm afraid I've never been to Cornwall. You should come one day. You'd like it. Of course, it's marred somewhat by the Cornish, but there you are. <laughs> I can't tend the garden like I once could, this wretched leg of mine. You know, I'm 70 next year. I wouldn't have guessed. You I may have identified another lovely boy. I glanced through your paper. It's only a first draft. Clearly. But it has potential. I think we'll walk as far as the end of the lake and then turn back. Your footnotes leave something to be desired. Ah. <laughs> I'm intrigued by your exploration of racial integration at the court during Elizabeth's reign. But you need to be more specific. You have a tendency to hurry on with your second point before you've conclusively made your first. For example, this woman you describe as being very brown in her youth. We want facts, because without facts, what does a historian have? Wild surmise, Dr. Ross. Exactly. Her name was Amelia Bassano. She was a court musician. Bassano? You've come across her before. Where did you read this? In the Bodleian, the Simon Foreman casebooks. Really? Are you free tomorrow morning? Uh, I'm giving a lecture at 12. Very well. Come to my rooms at 9 o'clock. 
29 other people are still seriously ill, including five who have lost 10 limbs between them. The are you awake, Dr. Rouse? Come in, Prosser. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I brought your tea. Yeah. March post? Uh, yes, sir. Another lot this morning. Most of it from America. Oh, I don't like the look of that. No doubt writing shall inform me that my shares have plummeted in value again. Oh, you could switch the wireless off. Yes, Dr. Rose. If it isn't Vietnam, then it's the minor strikes or rail strikes. If Mr. Heath was an Elizabethan, we wouldn't find ourselves in this state, Prosser. To the block with a lot of them. You're probably right, sir. Probably right. I know I'm right. Very good, sir. I, uh, I wondered. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you uh, would take this, sir, uh, in case any of the fellows might be interested. Macbeth? Uh, yes, sir. Banbury Players. It's rather challenging material. Uh, we'd all decided on French without tears, but we were overruled by the director. Ah, there's no democracy in amateur theatricals. No, sir. And who are you playing? The porter. <laughs> they said they didn't want to stretch me beyond my natural limits. <laughs> Drink, sir, is a great provoker of three things. Yes, go on. Merry, sir. Nose painting, sleep, and urine. A lechery, sir, it provokes and unprovokes. It provokes the desire but it takes away the performance. We'll make an Olivier of you yet. Uh, Mrs. Prosser wasn't entirely happy about me using the word urine on stage. Yet she has no such qualms when it comes to a frank and honest debate about impotence. Oh, I think that rather passed over our heads, sir. <laughs> uh, she says she doesn't go to the theatre to be shocked. People seldom do, most of pity. Have you ever performed on stage, Dr. Rose? At school, Twelfth Night. That was my first foray into the world of theatre. My Malvolio was something to behold. Yellow cross gartered stockings clinging to youthful thighs. Hard to imagine, sir. <laughs> no matter what one achieves in life, Prosser, it's impossible to live up to people's lofty expectations for a juvenile lead in cross gartered stockings. I should have liked to have played Hamlet. Hamlet? But alas, it was not to be. Oh, God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space were it not that I have bad dreams. Poetry, isn't it? Every word of it. Yeah, I'm afraid it rather leaves me cold, sir. Uh, poetry. How's your leg today, Dr. Rouse? Oh, as long as I keep moving it about. I hope you're not overdoing it. We're none of us getting any younger. The days perish and are scored to our account. And you have to say poetry leaves you cold? Ah, that'll be Lang. Excellent. You should read the sonnets, Prosser. If Shakespeare can't cure you, no one can. I shall certainly have a look, sir. Good morning. You must forgive me, Lang. In the rank sweat of an inseamed bed, stewed in corruption. I'll open a window, Dr. Rose. Distrust doth enter hearts that not infect. And love is sweetest season. There was a protest on the high yesterday afternoon. A group of hippie-ish undergraduates. I think they had some half-baked plan to rise up and overthrow Mr. Heath. <laughs> the fashionless fools. How is your work going with Professor Burnett? They're publishing the book next month. If he's lucky, it'll be read as far afield as Maudlin. Poor, tedious Burnett. We are all in the gutter, but some of us are staring down the drain. I think it's a fascinating book. Is it really? Well, no. But it's exceptionally well-researched. If it's well-researched but dull, nobody will read it but academics, and what's the point in that? Those academics sane enough to listen to aren't worth the bother. And the others? The vain, publicity-seeking idiots? Hardly an original idea between them. A.J.P. Taylor talks of history getting thicker as it approaches recent times. What does he know, the fool? As we approach recent times, A.J.P. Taylor gets thicker. <laughs> <sighs> Two minutes, excellent. Any quicker than I'll be running. Good morning, Dr. Ross. The Bodleian Library. The arsenals of divine vengeance. Houseman. The moment A.J.P. Taylor became a TV star, he began to neglect his tutorial work. The man's a crackpot. They all are. I seem to be the only one that can seize the bridle of celebrity and still remain committed to the college. Not like the others at all. 
ghastly, the lot of them. A poison of historians. <laughs> the collective noun. Absolutely. <laughs> The important thing to bear in mind about the case books, Simon Foreman is not always the most reliable of commentators. An unreliable narrator? Oh, I wouldn't go as far as that. He makes errors, certainly. Perhaps we can't forgive, but we can attempt to understand. <laughs> Professor Burnett says that Foreman makes a number of incorrect assertions about Macbeth. Mm. Foreman watched the original production at the Globe. He gives us the first existing accounts of several of Shakespeare's plays. But Foreman sees no merit in writing up his accounts immediately. Several weeks have elapsed before he pens his descriptions of the plays. And as a consequence, he muddles the details, combines fact with hearsay. And hearsay is heresy to the historians. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely, Dr. Rouse. Ah, here we are, Foreman's comments about Amelia Bassano. Well, hmm. she is high-minded. She hath something in her mind she would have done for her. And? She hath 40 pounds a year and was wealthy to him that married her in money and jewels. She can hardly keep a secret. She was very brown in youth. Then here, she seems to be with child of 12 days or weeks. Yes, I read that again. Uh, she seems to be... No, with... no, no, before that. She can hardly keep a secret. She was very brown in youth. Good Lord. Macmillan Publishers, good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. This is Dr. A. L. Rouse. I'd like to speak to Martin Fry, and it's extremely urgent. Yes, of course, sir. One moment, please. Uh, Martin Fry speaking. Fry, it's Rouse. The book is fine, I am fine, the weather is fine. Now that we've got the platitudes out of the way... You said it was an urgent... Yes, yes it is. I hope you're sitting down. Yes. For 300 years, academics have stumbled blindly in the dark. But now I have switched on the electric light bulb. Leslie, is, is everything all right? Better than all right. I have finally established the identity of Shakespeare's dark lady. You're absolutely sure? No doubt about it. I've barely been able to sleep all week. I thought you weren't going to start Shakespeare the Man until the summer, after the Simon Foreman book. But that's where I discovered the passage in the Foreman case books, quite by chance. After all I've had to endure from Burnett and Taylor and Schoenbaum, finally my work vindicated. She was very brown in her youth. Brown meaning dark. It seems so trite when you put it like that, but this is the final piece of the jigsaw. The Dark Lady Unmasked. So, who was Amelia Bassano? She was a court musician, married to William Lanier, also from a family of well-known court musicians. William. Will. The punning in the sonnets, it's almost too delicious. The ardent Lanier cuckolded by a wife who was no better than she ought to have been, and probably ten times worse. You are certain? Of course I'm certain. The greatest literary riddle finally solved. At last I can write a truly three-dimensional biography of Shakespeare, the Dark Lady will be just one chapter, but what a chapter, Martin. <laughs> the chapter that will consolidate my reputation once and for all. I need to get the book written as quickly as possible. I can't risk anyone else discovering Bassano's true identity and publishing before I do. You think that's likely? No. Very few academics have gone through the six Foreman casebooks in any detail, but it would be just my luck to have the cup dashed from my lips at the eleventh hour. Well, as your editor, excellent, I think... Excellent, excellent. Right. You'll tell Harold yourself, or should well, I? He is the man that writes our checks, but tell no one else that it should have fallen to me to solve this once and for all. Now I can have a little fun. Fun? A secret's only worth keeping if you can make others aware that one knows something that they do not. Knock, knock? You'll have to let yourself in. I can't make it to the door. Leslie. Lillian. I thought I'd surprise you. And you know how I like surprises. How's the foot? Wretched. The doctor says I have to keep it up. Swollen veins, apparently. Apart from that, you look... Now, don't say well. Most men of my age who are described as well are dead within the year. Ever the optimist. Oh, sweetie, I'm a realist. <laughs> 
But I have managed to revise the manuscript, Shakespeare the Man. And you won't even give me a hint about your closely guarded secret? Not until next year. I'll take it with me to the grave if I die before publication. <laughs> Will you help me to the window? Of course. <clears throat> They've employed a new gardener, an angelic vision in blue shirt and tight jeans. I've rarely seen a more perfect figure. I can gaze upon him wistfully if I hop to the window on my good leg and kneel on the window seat. You're incorrigible. Encourageable, if I didn't have my foot done up like this. Well... Very attractive. He's a disturbing influence, with gestures as one sees in Renaissance paintings. The face of Michelangelo's David, the vocabulary of a navvy. <laughs> I've quite fallen for him. So, this is just a social visit? Actually, no. I wondered if we could compare notes on the Simon Foreman case box. Foreman? I'm writing a new paper in my Elizabethan series about... Oh, yes, I heard. Lord Hunston. Well, about the Lord Chamberlain's mistress, specifically. His mistress? Yes. Emilia Bassano. Didn't know what time it was. The lights were low. Oh, oh. I leaned back on my radio. Oh, as soon as those difficulties are satisfactorily and equitably resolved, Britain stands ready to pay off all its remaining IMF debts. Whoever hath her wish, thou hast thy will, and will to boot, and will in overplus. And the top of sonnet 136. If thy soul check thee, that I came so near, Swear to thy blind soul that I was thy will, and will thy soul knows is admitted there. Excellent. Well? I, I'm not sure I get the point. Isn't it obvious? Shakespeare's punning. Will. William Shakespeare is volunteering to take the place of William Lanier, Emilia Bassano's husband. Oh, I see. I've decided to revise my chapter. I think it's important to make this explicit. The interchangeable nature of the two wills. And, of course, there's also the sexual innuendo at play here. The will. The manhood. Uh, yes. You will have another glass of milk, yeah? Thank you. Uh, to a happy Christmas. And a prosperous 1973. Yes. I've been reading your poem. And they remind me rather of Auden. Of Auden? Thank you. Did I say I liked Auden? Oh. Although, naturally, I do. You know Auden, don't you, Dr. Rouse? Well, he was an undergraduate. He used to come along to my rooms to read me the poems he was working on. What's he like? Rather too much interested in sexual intercourse. Did you... The question, I think, might be impertinent. I'm sorry. The truth is, we did not. He was always rather unappetizing to look at. One summer afternoon, he asked me along to his rooms in Peck. He pulled down the blinds and read me extracts from letters of friends of his. One, in particular, in the Mexican Eagle Oil Company, describing the adventures they were having with boys. What did you do? I was tempted, but I thought, fellows of all souls don't do this sort of thing. When the time came, I said, well, I must be getting back to all souls for tea. My relations with Whiston rather stopped at that point. I think the man's a genius. Yeah. I've never doubted it. Come and sit over here. Oh. Right. Uh, I think... Madeira makes me maudlin. <laughs> you know, Auden had the advantage of achieving a style of his own early on. And I think you have that same ability. Oh, thank you. I wonder if you might read this for me. What is it? Well, you're not the only poet who asks for my advice. Uh, my life is folding up, leaf by leaf. First one petal, then another is shed. 
I can no longer walk around the garden, let alone take tool as once I could. Well? I don't know. Like Betjamin, but without the irony. Go on. Yeah, it starts off all right, then partway through the first stanza it becomes prosaic and dreadful. The sort of thing one might write in a letter if one's heart isn't really in it. Don't make it out into the garden as much as I'd like to. A back's playing me up awfully. It's, it's dreadful. What advice would you give the writer? Leave poetry to poets. Please get out. Uh, I'm sorry? You didn't realise it was one of my poems? Y yours? N no. No, no, Please I... Please leave. Thought... I didn't mean... I think you've made your views perfectly clear, Lang. But, uh, Dr. Rouse... Get out! Tea? Yes, thank you. The telephone's ringing. Yes, I'm not deaf. It'll be Lang again. Lang? He's been telephoning ever since I got back yesterday. Oh. I think I may have misjudged him. A philistine, after all. No soul. Help yourself to milk. Thank you. Have you thought about what you're going to do? Do? About what? When your fellowship expires. Oh, I don't know. I shall go to Cornwall. Or America. If everything works out as expected with the Shakespeare book, once the secret's out... America? Then, to live? One always knows when one has begun to conquer America the incontrovertible evidence that one has made a name for oneself. Being interviewed on an American radio station, sandwiched between advertisements for Ford Motors and Crisco cooking fat. But what if the book doesn't work out as expected? But it will. Now that Macmillan have a winner on their list, I only hope and pray they have the good sense to keep a secret. I don't quite know how to tell you this. What? I think the secret's out already. What? There's quite a buzz going round Merton at the moment. They're all saying you've identified Emilia Bassano as the Dark Lady. No, it's impossible. Everyone's sworn to secrecy. Macmillan aren't sending out the proofs until March. Who have you told? Martin Fry, Harold Macmillan, obviously. Lang? I said he was a Philistine, not a traitor. But uh, Emilia Bassano? Aren't you just raking over well-trodden ground? I did expect something more insightful from you, Gillian. <sighs> Isn't it rather draining, being so disappointed in people all the time? Well, answer it. Rouse's rooms, Rouse's personal secretary speaking. Oh, dear. Tell him to go away. It's the Daily Telegraph. Oh, thank you. Yes, this is Rouse. What? They did what? Yes. Thank you very much. Well, that explains the leak. Yes? It seems that Macmillan have mistakenly sent out 12 proof copies of Shakespeare the Man. And love is sweet as seas and waves are So you laughed at Rouse's poem? I didn't know it was Rouse's poem. That's not an excuse. You're speaking from experience? He attacked Isaiah Berlin for laughing at him. Physically. Physically. Dug his fingernails into him. A.J.P. Taylor, his great friend, gave Rouse a bad book review. They haven't spoken in over 20 years. So I'm in good company. But you've lost your supervisor. And that's why you're here. Yes. I think it's an interesting basis for a book. You paint a very vivid portrait of the Elizabethan age. But... You're... Arguments are rather undermined by a number of clumsy misreadings of the source material. I'm sorry? The form and case books. If he was writing in Latin, then perhaps I could understand, but he's not. He's writing in English. What misreadings? Your line of argument about ethnicity in Elizabeth's court. Emilia Bassano. You quote Foreman as saying she was very brown in youth. Yes. But that isn't what he wrote at all. He describes her as being very brave. Brown? I think I'd know. I've been researching for my paper. I had a photostat made. There. She has £40 a year and was wealthy to him that married her, in money and jewels. She can hardly keep secret. She was very brave in youth. You see? Brave? 
Can I have I, I know it can be slightly testing, trying to make sense of Elizabethan handwriting, but they're not hieroglyphics. I mean, you don't need the Rosetta Stone to decipher Simon Foreman. Brave. I wouldn't expect that sort of error from an undergraduate. I certainly wouldn't expect it from a fellow. What would Dr. Rouse say if he was still talking oh, to God. me? Oh, God. Rouse. Lang. I'm sorry, Dr. Lawrence. I have to go. Can I borrow this? What? The photo stamp. Uh, but I want it back. Dr. Rouse. Have a moment. I'm expecting a call from the Times. Can it wait? I know you're not talking to me, but it's important. I really don't have time for this. I seem to have made a, a terrible error. And you see me as your confessor, how flattering. It was a misreading. I don't altogether know how it happened. A misreading of what? Emilia Bassano. I beg your pardon? She isn't brown. She's brave. You see, there... You can just make it out. It looks like a W, but in fact, it's a V. Give it to me. Give it to me. She could hardly keep secret because she was brave. Brown doesn't make any sense, really. It's not in context. Brave because she had spirit, perhaps. No shy but, but and retiring girl. Listen, plucking. you wrote in your paper that you I'm wrote... sorry, Dr. Ralph. You wrote Brown. Oh, that's the Times. They want me to publish an article on the Dark Lady. The news is getting round that I've identified Emilia Bassano... I've been trying to write the article as quickly as I can before somebody else breaks the story and I'm left with nothing but, but now... It's a but now, hypothesis. And whose fault is that? You're blaming me. I'm sorry. I, 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 I don't know what... Do forgive me, Lang. It, it's very difficult sometimes. The pressure of publication that preys on the mind. I completely understand. Even if it is brave, not brown, there's still the punning of the name Will. Will Lanier. That's more than enough to prove the case. You're still going to publish. I don't know what to do. Sit down, Lang. Sit down. Thou art to me a delicious torment. Flesh stays no farther reason, but rising at thy name doth point out thee as his triumphant prize. I am... Sorry, Dr. Rouse. I still have proud flesh, Lang. Age hasn't withered it. No want of conscience hold it that I call thee love, for whose dear love I rise and fall. Please. My lovely lord. No. The lady doth protest too much, Mr. Please, Dr. Rouse. I thought you were... A homosexual? Um, yes. Yes. I am, but... Well... <laughs> you can see yourself out. Very well. You are an opportunist, Lang. Then we have that much in common. I thought you came to console me, my hour of need. No. I came to tell you that you were wrong. Dr. Rose. Closer. <clears throat> Your teaser. Thank you. And uh, the times. At last. Oh, for heaven's sake. Would you like me to answer it, Dr. Rose? No, it's been ringing since seven. They must have got hold of an early edition of the paper. Professor Burnett wanted to know if you were up. I hope you told him I wasn't. Yes, sir. Uh, one of many, I'm afraid. Uh, all clutching their copies of the Times. And so it begins. No sign of Lang, I suppose? No, sir. No. I read the article. What did you make of it? Illuminating, sir. Casting light on the Dark Lady. Exactly, Dr. Rose. Although, personally, I'm still inclined to agree with Bernard Shaw. He makes a persuasive argument for Janet Davenant being the Dark Lady. You've read Shaw? The Dark Lady of the Sonnets. An excellent book, I thought. A uh, little learning is a dangerous thing, Prosser. I'm prepared to take the risk, sir. Oh, your post, Dr. Russ. Thank you. I took your advice, sir. Advice? The Sonnets. Quite profound. And racy in their way, aren't they? 
I've taken to reading them to Mrs. Prosser over a mug of Ovaltine. Quite the Renaissance man. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Tongues will wag, Prosser. You're not listening. I am listening. I'm just not agreeing with you. The facts are there for your perusal, Burnett, in the form and case books and also in the sonnets. Shakespeare standing beside Miss Bassano as she plays on the virginal. You've made that particular point sound rather sordid and disagreeable. Only quoting your article. No time to talk now. Far too much to do. You can't keep avoiding me. While I've still got breath in my body. Dr. Rouse. Good morning, Prosser. I've been looking for you, sir. This came this morning. <sighs> I thought you'd want to see it as soon as it arrived. My book. Shakespeare, the man. Congratulations, Dr. Rose. My passport to Hades. I beg your pardon, sir? Publish and be damned, Prosser. Lawrence. Gillian? Yes? This is David Burnett. I'm not disturbing you. I thought I'd let you know. I've got an advanced copy of Shakespeare the Man from Blackwell's. And? He still thinks Amelia Bassano was the dark lady? I quote, It is now all quite clear, when one comes to think of it, who else, who more convincingly would the dark lady have been? Oh, God! <laughs> I suppose it's wrong to be gleeful. Have you spoken to him? Well, I thought I'd wait a couple of hours. Savour the moment. My telephone's been ringing all morning. I'm damn near a horse from reading out selected passages. Oh, it's the sheer ruddy arrogance of it all. This is a work of fiction. There's not a scrap of solid proof. He doesn't need to be right. He's A.L. Rouse. Yes, yes. Leslie. Gillian, if you telephone... Then you'd have I... told me that you were too busy to see me. Are you coming to my dark lady luncheon on Sunday in the Wharton Oh, Home? Leslie, for goodness sake. Yes. No, now is not a good time. Thank you very much. You've been ignoring me ever since the book came out. I have been rather overworked. I've read the papers, I've seen what they've been writing. There is nothing that antagonises people more than presenting them with a the conclusion that all along was right before them. <laughs> Everyone's a critic. Some critics should be tied up, put in a bathtub and pissed on regularly for hours. I am sure that that would make them think twice. I'm mentally sick of it all. One sees a return of the old digestive troubles. Yesterday I passed a whole mushroom... What will become of me? Leslie. I've written a new article on the Dark Lady for the Times to silence my detractors once and for all. That was the hope. But everywhere I go, I'm surrounded by incompetence. They accepted the article a month ago, and still they haven't sent it to the printer. You don't think they're trying to tell you something? I'm sorry? Do I have to spell it out for you? Well, perhaps you do. You've laid yourself wide open to ridicule. I've made a perfectly valid assertion. It isn't it valid. It is quite probable that Amelia Vassano was the Dark Lady. This isn't about probability, Leslie. I will not be spoken to like this. This is about speculation dressed up as fact. It isn't a valid assertion because you can't back it up. Your hypothesis pivots on a misreading. Mm -hmm. Simon Foreman doesn't describe Emilio Bassano as brown. But you knew, didn't you? Knew what? That Foreman wrote brave, not brown. By the time I found out, it was too late. And you published anyway. It's a detail. Nothing more. The punning on the name Will, Emilia Bassano's husband, Will Lanier, is more than enough to support my claims. But, Leslie, that's another misreading. What? It's a pet name. An abbreviation of Emilia Lania herself. Emilia, Milia. It isn't William at all. How did you I've make... been researching it for my paper. Emilia was married in 1592 to an Alfonso Lanier. It took me less than half an hour to find it. There was no William Lanier. It's in the register of St. Bottles, Oldgate. I don't want to boast, Leslie, oh, really? but if I can discover the truth that quickly, if you just delved a little deeper... I'd even updated my book of Shakespeare's sonnets. Living vicariously through another poet. That was unkind. Gibbon says... The life of the historian must be short and precarious. Short? Perhaps not. But life is certainly precarious. What are you going to do? Do? About what? About the book. Isn't it just about to come out in the States? But what can I do? A simple mea culpa? I don't think so. And it's too late to revise. I shall ride out the storm and think what could have been. Who knows? Maybe I'll get away with it in America. By the way. Yes? 
You say that Emilio Bassano disappeared into the annals of history after she appears in the Foreman papers. Yes. She didn't. What? In 1611, she went on to publish Salve Deus Rex Judeorum, the first substantial book of poetry ever published by an English woman. So he's still hosting his dark lady lunch. You've got to admire his now. Ah, but that's the thing about Rouse. Pride comes before and after a fall. I told him, I said, you can't trot out idle speculation and parade it as bona fide fact. Well, we all told him. We're always telling him. I'm not entirely sure he enjoys spending time in libraries. He craves adulation without the hard work. Yes, he decided at an early age that humility was beneath him. Ah, good afternoon, lad. Professor Burnett. Dr. Lawrence. Alex. Not going to rouse his dark lady luncheon, then? No. It seems I've been inadvertently left off the guest list. Oh, dear. Has another of Rouse's friendships founded on the rocks of academic criticism? I'm not sure that one can entirely befriend Leslie. Only appease him with unconditional praise. <laughs> You'll be the new Veronica Wedgwood Lang, <laughs> ditched for daring to question the Oracle. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You should write to the Times. Point out exactly where Rouse went wrong with the book. Point by excruciating point. I don't believe in kicking a man when he's down. Well, surely that's the best time to do it. <laughs> Rouse, leaving all souls with his tail between his legs. Don't. I can't think of a better way to watch him go. Silly little A.L. Rouse. But the thing is, I couldn't prove that he's wrong even if I wanted to. What do you mean? I can fault the means. I'm just not sure I can fault the ends. You mean, it might be Emilia Bassano? I mean, it may very well be Bassano. It's a plausible hypothesis. And a hypothesis that can't be conclusively proved. Can't be conclusively disproved. Exactly. <sighs> not so much a dark lady, more a stab in the dark lady. <laughs> In Accolades by Christopher William Hill, Ian Richardson was Dr. A. L. Rouse, Joseph Kloska, Alex Lang, Nigel Anthony, Professor Burnett, Stella Gone, Dr. Gillian Lawrence, and Sean Barrett, Mr. Prosser. The executive producer was Nick Russell Pavia. Accolades, a Goldhawk Essential production, was directed by Gordon House. I am joined in the studio by one of England's foremost authorities on Stratford's William Shakespeare, the historian Dr. A. L. Rouse, yes, author of, of Shakespeare the Man, which is being described by many as a seminal biography of the dramatist <laughs> and poet. Uh, anybody who fails to describe it as a seminal work is hardly worth listening to. Uh, Dr. Rouse, one of the most fascinating aspects of your book is the confident assertion that you finally oh, no, identified no, no, Shakespeare's no, elusive no, no, no. dark it lady. It isn't an assertion, it's a statement of fact. The dark lady of Shakespeare sonnets was Emilia Bassano, a poet in her own right, passionate, if rather long-winded. And then you're satisfied that the book has settled the debate once and for there all? There is no debate, not any more. And, and what advice would you give to the, uh, the misinformed? How would you disabuse them? Uh, history is not a philosophy. It's a science. It's about simple fact, not convoluted hypothesis. The misinformed, as you call them, they should jolly well go out and buy the books that will set them right once and for all. Your own books, Dr. Rouse. As you said, I am the foremost authority.